I'm happy to pass the word to the moderator of the first session, Olivier Renault, um, Head of Business Development and Emerging Markets from Abbott. Um, without further ado, because I think we're already uh, a bit late for, on the timing, we'll start with uh, uh, Antonio's presentation on the impact that COVID had on, uh, it, on uh, its, uh, its uh, Italpharmaco portfolio and uh, business development uh, strategy. So I will pass uh, the ball to Juliana. Uh, Juliana, I think you're here, you're here to talk about product portfolio and asset acquisition as key strategy for growth. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. So good morning for everybody. I'm very happy to be here for the third time. So this is, this is not a first for me, but a first uh, in this situation with the mask. So maybe two disclaimers before I start. Um, one is whenever we, we, you see my eyes smaller, it's because I'm smiling with the mask <laughs> and the other one is we're not looking to the floor here we're looking to a screen so whenever yeah. we are here we're looking to a screen so this is it uh, my intention today is to bring some flavors and colors around the m a activities recently and then we can talk a bit about asino uh, but before that so my, my experiences are mixed between innovation and bdnl for the past 15 years and i I started with a family owned businesses in Latin America and I could join two of the top five companies in, in the region and responsible for drug development, drug discovery programs. And then I could really have the opportunity to immerse a bit um, deeper in the Silicon Valley area, the Basel area hub for innovation and also South Korean uh, hub. And then from that, I could um, take part on some very interesting journeys for Series A investments, biotech licensing, exclusive deals and co-developments. And then recently I joined Asino Pharma here in Switzerland, there in Switzerland, uh, to be responsible for both licensing and M&A activities for the company recently. Okay, so if we go for the, the, the first slide maybe, which I am responsible for switching, okay. And this is quite interesting when I, I put together some reports that we can see the completed deals in M&A for the past five years, they didn't change quite much despite the pandemic. So if we take the reports in the in maybe mid of this year or mid of last year, we could see some kind of uh, the acceleration in the first two quarters. So if you look to 2020, this is yes, probably due to the pandemic, but then we could see the recovery right after in the, four, in the, fourth, uh, the third and the fourth quarters. So if we take the five years in a row, we have, we have been keeping the average of 47, 48 billion dollars uh, transaction sizes per quarter. And of course, some clear spikes coming from the major transactions. So in 2019, we can see that there was the biggest spike for the last uh, five years because of the Bristol and Abbey's transactions and their acquisitions, of course. But then in 2020, we also saw some accelerated activities when Gilead bought Immunomedics and AstraZeneca bought Alexion in the, in the last quarter. So we. Again, I guess that the message is we saw the acceleration in the first uh, two quarters of 2020 due to COVID, but generally speaking, this is not so much preeminent when if we compare it to the other M&A activities in the, in the other sectors. And I guess that one other observation here is that 2021 here, this is just the first half and we may expect a lot of more activities coming uh, until the end of the year. So we are also to keep within the, within the average. And then if we look a bit further to the period of 2019 to 2021, which cover more or less the pandemic pre and post, we see some out of uh, pattern trends. So for example, in 2020, we could see a very big, I mean, much bigger, so 23% more activity in biotech 
R&D acquisitions. So what you are looking here on the table on your right is number of deals. And this is announced and completed deals. And it comprised also in 2021 year to date, so until 16th of September, more or less. So then if you look to 2020, we do have 20% uh, more biotech acquisitions. And this is mainly due to more significant participation from the multinationals. So a lot of deals we could see coming from them, and not just the ones we mentioned before that peaked, but also some other mid-size acquisitions on biotechs coming from multinationals. And then quite interestingly, one year later, we saw, so we, we, we are seeing already, and this is just until September, we've seen a 30% increase in the divestments from the multinationals, which quite evenly sp are split between product and portfolio pruning, but also divestments of the full facilities in some regions. And this is probably linked so they invest in the future and then they prune what they have as mature or standalone. And this is what we are uh, seeing around in 2021. A lot of opportunities. Activity from GSK is more preeminent if you look to statistics. But also we can see the other ones, the Takira and Sanofi playing a very important role in the divestment sector. And then taking this into consideration and giving you a bit more introduction on Asino, the company is re very proud to, be, uh, to have the Swiss heritage, to be established since 1836. And now with five operations, uh, manufacturing sites, and five covering five ma major different regions in the emerging markets. The turnover this year is to be a half billion euros, and we have our business split into B2C, which is 85% of the revenues, and also B2B with uh, out licensing and CMO activities. When we look to acquisitions, this is mainly the foundations for Asino. And looking to the local winners, their legacy in brand loyalty, and also their very, very strong footprint in the regions. This was mainly our strategic rationale for growth until now. So we're starting with the acquisition of Copa Farm in Russia, also Pharma Start in Ukraine. This is how we started in, in CIS region. And uh, Pharma Start by the time was the seventh player in Ukraine. So we could also benefit, not just benefit from the acquisition, but we could really keep up the performance and out, outperform the business case, actually. And then we enter the South African region, so English-speaking Africa, through acquisition of the Letha healthcare business. And at the same year, in 2017, we could have the, the distribution partnership with Merck that takes us with a very important position for brand, uh, branded products in the CIS region until now. And we are proud to say that we tripled their business as they, they were having before. And this is a very important chunk of our business in the region so far. Then in 2018, we acquired a women's health portfolio in Russia, which we also repeat this year for Il with Ilmix. So we now accumulate a, a very strong uh, women's health uh, therapeutic area in Russia. But uh, the country is huge, and this is where we, we are now focusing to expand a bit more. And then a very important acquisition for us uh, within the multinational sector was the, the divestments coming from Takira in 2020 that helped us to, to strengthen our portfolio in Meta, Ukraine, and also English-speaking Africa. So we were able, and this, mo and, and this acquisition, to hire more than 260 people and to integrate them perfectly. And I guess that this turned Asino into a platform for integration and execution. And as probably most of you know, uh, this week we got um, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the public the news that uh, Asino was acquired by an Abu Dhabi fund called ABQ. And so we are not, no longer from, a, um, from a, a private equity Nordic and, and a Vista Capital. 
and now uh, this is still on, 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 their, on their final stages, but this was already announced. So this can also bring a lot of um, energies and a lot of uh, looking forward to the future and establishing Asino you know, even more as a, as a, health, a healthcare platform. And if we look to our regions of geographical coverage, this is uh, mainly the five regions that I mentioned before. So Central America on your left, and then we do have the uh, commercial operations in Middle East, Turkey, and Africa. And we called Meta region first, where we cover GCC, Turkey, Egypt, Iraq, and French West Africa. And then we, we, we call it ESA, where we cover mainly South Africa and adjacencies, English-speaking countries. And also CIS region with mostly Ukraine, Belarus, and Central Asia. And when we look to this map, Asino now is looking more to strengthen the position in the regions than to expand more geographically. So this is the main objective right now as we do see a lot of room to improve our growth, not just in organically, but also through licensing and local acquisitions. So this is what we are looking for. This is where we look for partners to collaborate. And especially if we talk about therapeutic areas, these are the areas that we are already very strong, let's say with our current and legacy portfolio. Uh, mainly in the gastrointestinal area and infectiology and pain. And we are now uh, looking to expand also to respiratory, hormones, and oncology, where we think we can really play a significant role in. Uh, Sino has been quite active in the launches, with more than 150 different launches planned by 2025. And the acquisition, again, will still play a very important piece of a senior strategy for the next years to come. So in a nutshell, we think that we have a very good capabilities for a partnership, not just proving track record for execution and integration, but also we do have a, a high quality perception among the HCPs. We bring the, the, the quality of Swissness, but also very important, the reliability with our clients to be on time, to be really, I mean, uh, making, keeping up our, our commitments, and also the compliance and ethics standards are really, really high in Asino. So I guess that I could, uh, this is it. Again, thanks a lot. I look forward to the Q&A right after the next presentation. Thank, thank you, uh, Juliana. So, thank you, uh, my pleasure. Uh, uh, I will now leave the floor to uh, Mayank. Um, Mayank, that is uh, um, uh, in Singapore, and will present you now the um, the business expansion in Asia Pacific. Uh, Mayank, if you, uh, I don't know if you hear us from Singapore. Yes, I can hear you very well. Thank you, Olivia. I hope I am audible and my screen is visible. Yeah, we hear you very well. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, so as, as Olivia mentioned, I'll be talking about uh, branded assets um, and the transactions around branded assets um, in Asia Pacific. Uh, before I get started, a little bit about myself. Uh, so I'm managing business development and alliance management for Minarini in Asia Pacific. Asia Pacific for us as a region covers Southeast Asia, China, North Asia, excluding Japan, uh, Australia, New Zealand, and the Indian subcontinent. Uh, prior to joining Minarini a couple of years ago, uh, I was working for a Chinese company, Ifan, and I was managing their international BD. And before that, I was a part of the Novartis group for a total of five years, working for Sandoz and then doing Novartis Metro brand divestments. Started off my career uh, in the US working for Boehringer Ingelheim. Uh, so basically, I have been involved in deal making across the spectrum of innovation be it genetics, uh, branded assets, um, mature brands, biosimilars, and new, and new molecular entities, uh, being involved in deal making uh, across US, Europe, and, uh, and Asia Pacific, and also worked on transactions that are both inward and outward in nature, including acquisitions in licensing, out licensing, and divestments. 
Um, education wise, uh, I'm a biomedical engineer uh, from University of Texas at Austin. Uh, of course, business development has polluted me, so I don't know how much of science I still remember. Uh, and I'm an MBA from London Business School. Guys, before getting started, I would really like to thank the organizers at the Pharma Synergy event, uh, especially Christina and Jane, for all of your patience, instructions, and guidance uh, to facilitate this remote participation. Olivier, as you mentioned, it is actually my first conference after two years as well. Of course, I'm a little bit jealous of you guys and others who are, who are able to join in person, but still nonetheless, very happy to be a part of this event. And thank you so much, uh, Antonio, Juliana, and of course, uh, Olivia, for all of the camaraderie and the brainstorming that we did together for this session. For the purpose of this discussion, I'm uh, pretty much gonna be uh, dividing the presentation into three different sections. The first section, just to give a flavor about branded assets, what kind of branded assets we are talking about and the prevalent deal types. Uh, then I'll move on to uh, the opportunities, challenges, and the creativity around deal making in Asia Pacific. And then finally, talking a little bit about Minarini, uh, Minarini in APAC, and the kind of deal making we are involved in. So, to get started, laying out the context. So, uh, when it comes to branded products, typically we are talking about innovative assets. Uh, that may be already on the market or, um, or undergoing uh, the, the entire regulatory pathway. Typically, these products are associated with scientific promotion uh, and they may require a need to create the market. From a regulatory standpoint, they require full clinical evidences and uh, there may be long registration timelines associated with these assets. From a BD standpoint, there are fewer opportunities that exist for such assets higher investments typically, but at the same time, the quantum of the opportunity could actually be attractive enough. Would like to move on and talk about um, what different kind of branded assets uh, we typically look at. What are the considerations that go behind selecting these assets and which ones could be attractive for any deal making? The overarching principles when we are looking at any branded assets is of course the strategy, it has to be a good fit with the portfolio, uh, sizable enough sometimes to even determine the strategy itself. Differentiation, it is becoming increasingly important about the value proposition that such assets may bring in, be it for the patients or the healthcare providers or the payers or the physicians. And then of course profitability, which in a way ties into the overall strategy as well. Sorry, this looks like a rainbow slide, uh, but it was kind of interesting when we were looking at internally with my team with different kinds of branded assets. So you look at um, red being uh, not attractive and the darkest of green being more attractive. And we look at different brand types against different considerations when we are assessing uh, any opportunities. So if we look at products that are still under patent and on the market uh, from a different originator, Typically, the access or the deal prevalence of such assets is relatively low. If you go on to the next category, which is on-market products that are nearing LOE, or maybe one or two years before LOE, uh, there is some prevalence. There are, uh, there are MNCs, big MNCs, that are looking to offload these assets via distribution deals or divestments as well. But the growth potential of such assets is rather challenging, uh, and it really comes down to a play of investing in a particular market or not. Then you have branded generics uh, that of course present similar kind of challenges as I was mentioning about the near LOE products. Now, when it comes to pre-launch brands, um, especially if we look at new drugs that are approved in certain markets, let's say maybe Europe or US, but not approved in certain other markets in Asia Pacific or China, uh, rather low um, prevalence of such deals, but these can be very attractive uh, because um, at a very high level, these assets are kind of de-risked from a regulatory standpoint. Uh, the margins, the profitability can be there because there can be a price premium that, uh, that can be obtained, especially if there is some kind of value proposition that such kind of drugs, which are already approved in certain markets, but not in Asia, can actually present. 
Then, of course, clinical stage assets with new molecular entities. Uh, typically, you know, there's a lot of competition that you see with uh, different MNCs. Uh, many of these deals happen at a global level, if not global, at a multi-regional level. Um, and here it is really important to be nimble, to be selective, and to look at then again uh, opportunities that are fitting with the overall strategy. Moving on, and uh, the last slide for this section where I lay out the context, I would like to talk about uh, different types of deals that we look at um, in, uh, in Menarini. The first is, of course, brand acquisition, where you acquire the full rights. Uh, this is more common for on-market assets. Uh, of course, I mean, the benefits being that you can book the sales and you have the ownership, uh, develop the brand further, uh, life cycle management initiatives, so on and so forth. Uh, the challenge is, of course, being uh, that there's a high upfront associated with such kind of opportunities. Uh, also in Asia Pacific would like to mention that uh, there are not many brand acquisition opportunities for only the region. Uh, you have China specific deals uh, that many MNCs look at, but when it comes to Southeast Asia, most of these um, markets are not very sizable and they may be linked with another bigger brand divestment opportunity covering other uh, regions like Middle East or broader emerging markets as well. Then we look at distribution and promotion, which is the third column here. Um, uh, I mean, these are very prevalent deals that we are looking at, can be very sizable as well, but typically very, very thin margins that we look at. And um, we've been looking at deals that provide single digit margins up to a particular threshold of the forecasts, and then increasingly double mid, mid double digit margins. So there could be risks associated with most of these distribution and promotion deals. And of course, there's a lot of competition with uh, quite a few local players that we have in Asia Pacific uh, that could be strong enough to actually uh, command, their, uh, command their participation in such deals at a local level too. Uh, then there is, of course, the CSO or the promotion only approach um, that Minarini is not uh, proactively pursuing, but you have those um, very, um, very well established players in Asia Pacific, just like other parts of the world. Um, and, and here, you know, it's more about a simple and straightforward deal structure and limited risk, limited responsibility, a low risk and low reward. What we in Menarini are particular excited about exploring further is the long-term licensing, where you do get the marketing authorization. You may not get perpetual rights to the trademark. Uh, you are able to book the sales. There are significant margins, some upfront, not as much as what you would see for a typical acquisition deal. And then uh, there will be sales targets, but then again, uh, they may not be as stressful or strenuous or uh, regular uh, the way you would see on a monthly or quarterly basis for actually distribution deals. So after laying the context, I would like to talk about uh, Asia Pacific a little bit. So why is Asia Pacific relevant? Uh, because of multiple macro indicators. We look at market size, growth expectations, GDP trends, population sizes, all reflect towards Asia Pacific as being an exciting space. Uh, I'll not go into a lot of these numbers, uh, but just key uh, kind of observations from what we've seen uh, based on the data in the last one year. Uh, if we add up China, Japan, and Asia Pacific, uh, uh, or Southeast Asia, uh, Australasia, we are looking at um, a combined market size, which is a little bit uh, more than Europe. Uh, we do see strong growth coming from um, China and, uh, and, uh, and of course, Southeast Asia and Japan. Some of these growth numbers may not be that exciting for Asia because of 2020 numbers that have been a little bit skewed one way or the other. But overall, the growth trend has been rather robust. And I'll not go into the population sizes that also reflects uh, further the opportunity that exists in these markets. While this is the easy part, the difficult part in Asia Pacific is to be able to do harmonized deals because the markets are so different from each other, because the companies have different presence, because the regulations are different, because the whole healthcare setup is different. Uh, ability to do harmonized deals um, in Asia Pacific uh, is rather challenging. So on one dimension, um, there is capability gap that typically companies have across their different local affiliates. 
Many a times this is because you have uh, the European or the North American companies that have set up their presence in Asia Pacific, not in one go, but bit by bit by bit, starting off with few markets and then expanding, typically by uh, joint ventures or M&As. And this is where you see that uh, different companies have different kind of capabilities in different markets. And this is something which is relevant for Minarini as well. You also see that there are different prescribers for the same product across different markets, uh, also different channels that could differ from country to country. The sheer maturity of different countries is actually very varied. We have developed markets that have holistic reimbursement approaches. You have Korea, you have Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, Australia in one bucket. Then you have China that is fast catching up with its own dynamics. And then of course, you still have those emerging markets with the inherent issues of emerging markets like in Indonesia, like a Vietnam with amazing potential like Philippines, uh, but still not there yet. And finally, the regulatory complexity, um, be it uh, the requirement for zone 4B stability data, be it the requirement for local clinical trials when it comes to innovative products for China, local BE studies when it comes to generics in Taiwan, Caucasian data that is needed for Australia. So with all of these different, and this is by no means comprehensive, <laughs> uh, with all of these uh, complexities coming from different sources, uh, harmonized deal making is always a challenge and um, you either have to look for the right opportunities or drive flexibility internally and with partners to do cluster specific deals than actually region specific deals. would now like to quickly talk about the need for creativity to be able to be successful in deal making in Asia Pacific. We were talking about in distribution deals. So there's increasing competition for in distribution deals of mature brands in the region. Typical margin expectations are extremely low as well, because many a times these in distribution deals or out distribution from an MNC standpoint are driven by cost saving reasons and to be able to deliver value to the licensor while at the same time uh, invest towards the growth of these mature brands and at the same time be profitable is always a challenge. What we do in Minarini is basically we are very, very selective and we continue to look for uh, the right fit uh, and also try to be creative when it comes to margin structuring. The second kind of deals that, of course, we look at is divestments of products by MNCs. Again, there is a little bit of um, challenge because of the fact that there are not local deals happening in many of the markets. Uh, you do see local divestments in China, um, maybe sometimes in, you know, in other markets as well based on the size of the brand. But typically, you look at region-specific approach and to be able to justify the PNL uh, internally for a broad acquisition is rather challenging. So one of the creative approach here is to explore follow on deals. So um, have been in discussions with few companies. So we are always collaborating, even if we are competing. Uh, companies who are looking at an acquisition of the entire basket of countries, and then you do follow on deals with them or in parallel deals with them. Of course, this has to be aligned with uh, the license or, or the divesting party. But this is where I think there can be much more value creation from the divestments of such assets across different companies involved. Another interesting trend is the inflow of cash in the region. Not only are MNCs investing, not only are companies like Menarini investing in the region, you also have private equity funds. Private equity funds and their portfolio companies are acquiring brands. Um, and uh, they are also forming, forming JVs with other pharma companies. And of course, this is. Uh, this is a challenge when you're looking at uh, established pharmaceutical companies such as Menarini, where um, business cases need to be well reasoned and the investments have to be well rational. And uh, this is where uh, I would like to mention that we are indeed uh, very much socializing and uh, you know trying to find ways with these uh, private equity funds, uh, be it in terms of JVs or more importantly in terms of commercial partnerships 
because these PE funds, if they are looking at acquisitions of brands across the region, they do not intend to set up commercial teams in each and every market. One interesting trend before I go into uh, Minarini, uh, we've been seeing that Asia Pacific companies are transitioning from being licensees to licensors. So we see that 17% of the total deal making uh, across the major regions, at least North America, Europe, and Asia Pacific, 17% of uh, the licensors or the number of deals that have, um, of course, uh, entailed some kind of out licensing are coming from Asia Pacific. Even within Asia Pacific, we see that 46%, which is close to half of the total deals, are actually deals that involve out licensing of assets that have been developed in Asia to outside of Asia. And then finally, you see that China is leading the way. Uh, close to, um, the numbers look very, very close, but it's not an error. <laughs> so 46% again, and uh, China is basically accounting for close to half of all of the innovation-led out-licensing deals that are happening in Asia Pacific. I'll not go into a detail of all of these different deals, but this is just to provide a flavor that when it comes to uh, different Chinese companies, they're acting both as licensees when it comes to uh, the China market and also licensors. The big message here is that you see big pharma, you see investors, they, they have started seeing China as a reputable innovation hub to source the next, next blockbusters. You see companies like Abvi, like Eli Lilly, like Amgen, in licensing these assets from China and then taking the development uh, pathway forward for US and other mature markets. Mindful of time, I'll move on to a uh, uh, very quick snapshot of what we are doing at Minarini in Asia Pacific. Very quick overview, Minarini is a $4.5 billion um, group. Uh, we are dominant in, um, in different therapeutic areas in the primary care space with, of course, goals um, in oncology and specialty care as well. In Asia Pacific, uh, we, are close to, we were close to $700 million uh, until last year. And based on very recent acquisitions that we've performed, uh, the full year impact of these deals is going to propel us to close to $900 million uh, within next year, if not more. Again, uh, the therapeutic areas that we have predominantly uh, at the global level are also mapped um, uh, at the regional level. We are very unique in the sense uh, that we, are, uh, we have a direct presence in mostly all of um, the Asian markets. Japan is a blank, but Japan, you do have you know, those local nuances, very strong local companies, and of course, presence of MNCs and their strong local offices but very uniquely positioned in the sense that we have strong presence in, in China, Southeast Asia, each and every country in Southeast Asia, uh, Australia, New Zealand, and uh, the Indian subcontinent as well. And in these markets, we are pursuing different kind of deals, be it innovative products, on-market brands, value-added medicines, and clinically proven consumer health products. A quick flavor on our deal-making activities um, in Asia Pacific. We are looking at product acquisitions. Uh, very recently, uh, we uh, acquired the rights to Cialis um, in China, which uh, effectively makes us very close to being the number one company in men's health uh, in China. We already have the largest brand for premature ejaculation, and now with the second largest brand for erectile dysfunction, which is Cialis, uh, it positions us very, very favorably and, uh, and for growth uh, in China in this particular space. Acquired as, uh, from AstraZeneca Crestor, this was uh, towards the end of last year uh, to further boost our presence in the primary care space in Australia. We are looking at in-licensing as well, innovative assets. Um, uh, we got uh, Miro Gabalin from Daichi Sankyo, our existing partner always looking to work with the same partners as well to be able to uh, then drive value, especially when there is an established uh, mechanism of functioning. 
and also uh, Nasally's uh, products uh, in the OTC space that we have. And of course, we are continuously looking at commercial partnerships, the in-distribution leads that I was mentioning earlier. We have, uh, we have a portfolio of products from MSD that we've been managing, we've been growing for the last five years, that is now, and now we've uh, extended that collaboration for another five years, uh, covering different therapeutic areas, pretty much all countries in Southeast Asia as a strategic partner. Uh, and the size of the revenue of all of these brands combined is a little bit north of 200 million, which further uh, establishes and showcases our credentials as a trustworthy, long-term, sustainable partner. In the same spirit, would like to mention that we have multiple partnerships across companies. You can see here, quite a few of these companies are big, few companies are not so big. We value all partnerships equally. And our partnering philosophy is basically around investing in partner brands. Just to put things in perspective, in Minarini globally, close to 85 to 90% of all sales come from in-licensed, acquired, or in-distributed products, which is partnered products. So BD and m and is very much a part of the DNA of the company. We do not look at our own in-house product p &L separately and BD products p &L separately. That, that is simply not uh, second nature to us. So purely from that standpoint, we are very responsible in deal-making but we do not differentiate. And once we internalize an asset in whatever form based on the ownership structure coming from a deal, we really look at the growth avenues uh, in the very best uh, meaningful manner as much as possible. Would like to highlight that when it comes to compliance, we have the utmost standard. Um, our chairman of the board uh, has been uh, the head of compliance as, uh, at the Novartis group previously, Eric Cornu. And I uh, would like to mention that all of these efforts that we are putting in is with a sing single goal that we want to be the partner of choice for all companies that are uh, similar minded like ours. To start, uh, I would like your views, um, Antonio, Mayank and, and Juliana, on the, um, uh, the outlook for the for, for this year on the COVID. We, we saw the presentation from uh, Antonio that uh, COVID in itself had uh, an impact, especially on promotion, promotional sensitive uh, brands. Um, I'd like to know how you see this going forward. And I think it would be interesting to see because the, the presence here goes across different regions. So I think it can also give a bit of perspective to the audience as to how, you know, how COVID will impact the, basically the world when we look, because I think we covered the world here. Maybe ladies first, Juliana. <laughs> thank you, thank you. No, so definitely COVID had a, a very important impact in our revenues, in our senior revenues in 2020. Uh, across different regions, uh, it, the impact was pretty different. So CIS could benefit a bit from the price increase. So we, we didn't feel much in the end uh, the, of the year. The turnover was pretty much uh, uh, as budgeted. But South, South Africa, so is a, is a region suffered a lot from COVID impact. The second wave hit the, uh, the region very hard, even harder than the first one. Uh, the hospitals were full until even February this year, with a lot of uh, selling and attention being paid to anti-infectives area mostly. Uh, so the only only therapeutic area, I mean, the only business unit that could benefit a bit from an increase was the vitamin, so OTC region uh, area, but branded products were really, really uh, below the budget. Uh, and also we suffered a lot from some supply issues in the region. And then if we go to the meta region, I guess that the most impacted country for us was Iraq. Iraq also had uh, very severe lockdowns and uh, our sales performance was below the, the budget. And then uh, the rest of Meta together with the Latam region, we, we could get on, on budget, I guess that both because of the portfolio mix, but also because we could sign us, uh, we could launch some important uh, products coming from licensing at the time. So kind of equilibrated our 
our expectations, let's see. And for this year, so the outlook is more, uh, it's more optimistic. So we are uh, above the, the market growth and above our budget right now. So we are really kind of uh, recovering the, the, the losses from last year. And again, keeping the portfolio mix and uh, strengthening our, our uh, di the diversification and acquisition strategy is, is still important so we can keep up for the, for the volume loss. Okay. Mayank, I don't know if you, if you want to comment. Uh, sure, Olivia. Uh, <laughs> I'll just continue with the, with the same thread of diversity in Asia Pacific that I was talking about during my presentation. So because Asia Pacific is diverse and Minarini's portfolio is diverse in these markets, even our approaches have been very different across the different countries in the region. I'll just bucket the countries um, in, th in three different ways. So on one hand, you have China. Uh, China with all of its uh, you know, potential and also local challenges is pretty much back on its feet. And here, uh, as I was mentioning earlier, uh, we have a significant proportion of our sales coming from Cialis and Prodigy, the two products for erectile dis dysfunction and also uh, premature ejaculation. Now, these two products have a very strong uh, e-commerce angle to it. Uh, and, you know, these products have really grown a lot in the last one year. Uh, then the second bucket is actually the mature markets. In the mature markets, let's talk about, you know, Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore. Um, Australia is a little bit of an outlier. Um, the rate of vaccinations is high and, you know, the access to HCPs that our field force has is also getting that. Uh, of course, there is still an impact, but, you know, we are a little bit more confident about being able to predict that we should be back to our growing trend rather soon. The challenge, Olivia, comes with a third bucket. And this is where, you know, you have countries like Indonesia, Vietnam, uh, Thailand, Malaysia with so much potential big populations and, you know, increasing access to healthcare as well, a trend that we've been seeing. But now because of COVID, there's a little bit of a break over that because you see that the sheer rate of vaccinations in these countries is actually um, rather low. Uh, also in terms of the government response, it's not really well coordinated. And this is something where you see the benefit of EU as well. Uh, and uh, I would say that in these countries, as Minarini, we've been developing a lot of digital strategies to still be able to access the HCP communities, do loads of online CMEs. We form these telemedicine partnerships, uh, really focusing a lot on valuable content creation. So for this bucket, you know, the positive is that we see a lot of uh, digitalization happening. In terms of Minarini, yeah, I mean, uh, we still remain positive. We are a family-owned company really want to invest in these markets in a meaningful way. We have been active in deal making. Uh, so the current environment has not really stopped us uh, from doing, you know, responsible investments. Thank you, uh, Mayank. Maybe uh, moving on to the next question. Uh, I think uh, we've seen the presentation from Juliana, which is, uh, um, um, I mean, which come from Asino, which is actually a business case of how you can be a successful uh, in emerging market pure play through simple acquisition. So I'll be interested in especially Antonio and, and you, Mayank, I'll be interested in understanding for you two things. One, um, to what extent, and I think you already touched on that, Mayank, and, and, and also uh, you, Antonio, to what extent external growth is a key driver for your strategy? And has it been always the case of your organization? Uh, or has it changed? And the other question that I would have for you is, um, to what extent emerging market is a key element for your for your growth uh, growth of your portfolio um, uh, today and going forward? Well, uh, with Alfago, external growth is is very important. I think that I also have um, highlighted a touch upon uh, this also with the presentation, uh, not only um, for the let's say historical approach and how opportunistically we have been. Um, in growing the portfolio, but certainly also in the in the future. Uh, so we would very much like looking at the licensing acquisition for further boosting of uh, uh, the the portfolio sales. 
Um, we will also uh, boost, of course, our, our portfolio through the internal R&D. So ideally, we will have uh, soon uh, news uh, that will uh, bring us to next year for our Givino start in uh, phase three in Duchenne. Then, of course, uh, if it goes through with the launch planned at least in 2023, 2024, and then, of course, uh, we are supposed to see also a, 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 a remarkable growth due to internal uh, R&D assets. But uh, in the short term, for sure, the external acquisition re remain very important for the licensing. Um, and emerging markets are something we are closely looking at, and especially as was touched upon in, in, in the presentation, um, there are important innovative drugs uh, also in emerging markets that we are looking at whether there is possibility to import that innovation into Europe. We are looking at the number of programs uh, right now, even from um, uh, APAC, Southeast Asia, uh, looking at uh, what it is possible to, to look at these assets also from uh, uh, for European uh, commercialization. Um, regarding the uh, licensing parts, uh, the, the emerging markets, uh, the APAC, SIA, remain critical for, for Italian pharma. We don't have a, 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 a direct presence in, in most of these uh, countries. So we certainly need uh, to have more and more partners uh, giving us the possibility to distribute our products also in, in those territories. And you will see in, in the very short term future, there will be news of deals that we have made in, in this regard. So stay, stay tuned for news in, uh, in this regard. Uh, we recognize key drivers uh, for growth uh, from the growing healthcare demand, uh, but also the improvement in the healthcare infrastructure. So we would very much like our products as well uh, to be considered there and, and thereby also very important for the, for the health licensing. Both markets and definitely would like to play a role there. Thank, thank you, Antonio. Mayank, maybe a quick word for the conclusion before we before we wrap up. Sure. Thanks, Olivia, for the opportunity. So, look, when it comes to inorganic growth, yeah, of course, I've already mentioned that you know how important it is, and it's a part of uh, the Minarini's DNA anyway. Uh, with that said, uh, an interesting point, Olivia, that you made has that changed. Uh, our approach has the COVID, uh, you know, scenario changed our approach towards towards deal making. Uh, so two points to highlight here, Olivia. On one side, you see that the number of opportunities, at least the way I look at it, has increased. You do see in countries like China, where there's volume based procurement, MNCs are losing, you know, their top line because of more access to generics, and they are becoming a little bit more protective of the top line in few markets. At the same time, evolving business model is also kind of, uh, you know, entailing more and more deal opportunities uh, in Asia Pacific and beyond. Also few companies, you know, inno innovative companies in US or Europe that were looking to set up their own direct presence in Asia seem to have, you know, postponed their plans by a couple of years because of the uncertainty around the environment. So the sheer inflow of opportunities has increased. Now, on the other hand, when it comes to Minarini, uh, even when we look at our own products, of course, there is an element of risk hedging here. We have our forecasting exercise, and I'm sure that all of us companies are going through the budgeting exercise right now. There are so many unknowns here, uh, you know, so many variables around. And this is where if there is a meaningful opportunity where, you know, uh, there's, uh, there's also an avenue to hedge any of the risks from the projections coming off our top brands, then uh, at least management at Minarini is becoming further open to such kind of deal making. Very quickly, talking about emerging markets, absolutely uh, emerging markets are the key when it comes to growth um, ambitions. Uh, Minarini has presence in Latin America, in Middle East, in Russia CIS markets, different divisions, uh, headquarters as well. In Asia Pacific, uh, given the fact that we don't have direct presence in, in Japan, Olivia, it's kind of noteworthy that we uh, that 20% of the total sales of the group, across, approximately 20% are coming from Asia Pacific. So, and the sheer uh, inflow of capital, the, uh, on a soft side, the attention, you know, with our global CEO and our global business development team for the opportunities that we run here, is extremely encouraging and also reflects our commitment to the emerging markets. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayang. So